Now, we'll get back to classifying numbers into those sets of real numbers uh, in just a minute. We'll get back to it when we go through some practice problems, and we'll talk about some nuances of classifying numbers. One of the things we're going to find out is that numbers oftentimes, in fact, almost always belong to more than one set. Okay, but uh, what we need to do first is talk about some other definitions of terms related to sets, things that we do with sets. Okay, and these are going to seem even more um, specific and nuanced than the last set of terms. At least those sets applied to all numbers, but at least you've probably heard of rational numbers and irrational numbers before. Maybe you didn't remember what it was, but you've probably heard of all of those different number sets, counting numbers, integers. Those are words that you're probably familiar with from the past. What I'm going to show you now, you may have never heard of before, uh, but it is an important concept for understanding the logic of dealing with sets, and specifically sets of numbers. Okay, so first of all, we're going to talk about the intersection of two sets. Ever heard of this before? If not, you, you're not alone, uh, and we're going to learn about it because it helps you understand sets a little bit better, but it might be brand new to you. So just sort of take your time in understanding this. When I say the intersection of sets, I represent that with this symbol here. Intersection is like an upside down U, okay? A intersect B. What this means is set A intersect set B. And when I say I'm looking for set A intersect set B, I'm saying I'm looking for the set of elements that are in set A and in set B. Okay, now the word and makes it sound like it's going to be more inclusive because it's and, right? But actually what this means is I'm looking for the set of elements that are present in both sets. And my final set is only going to include elements that are in set A and set B. If something's just in set A or just in set B, the set A intersect B isn't going to include them. It only includes the things that are in both. Now, let me show you what I'm talking about here with a real world example. Let's go back to documenting eye colors. And let's say that in ninth grade, the eye colors of the students are either blue, brown, green, or hazel. I pulled the class. I figured out what their eye colors were. I made a list. Uh, when I make a list in sets like this, I'm just not, I'm not going to write the repeats. So I'm not going to write blue, blue, brown, brown, green, blue, brown, green. I just write each element one time, blue, brown, green, hazel. In 10th grade, I found that students' eye colors were brown, green, hazel, gray. Okay, so I've got these eye colors in grade 9, these eye colors in grade 10. I'm going to call this set A. This is how I show that I'm talking about a set. I give it a name, A equals, and then I use my set notation, B equals. And then what happens when I do A intersect B? Well, okay, the set A intersect B is only allowed to include things that are in both sets. Is blue in both sets? No, it gets booted. Brown, yes. Green, yes. Hazel, yes. Gray, no. Uh, so the set A intersect B is just going to be brown, green, hazel. Another way I can say this is instead of A intersect B, grade 9 eye colors intersect grade 10 eye colors. Uh, and then I'm only going to list the things that are in both sets. All right, there's another uh, complementary uh, operation. Instead of intersect, we can do the union of two sets. In this case, the symbol for union looks like a U. How convenient is that? A union B. So when I say set A union set B, I'm talking about the set of elements that are in set A or set B. In this case, if it's in set A, I'll list it everything regardless of whether it's in set B or not. And if it's in set B, I'll list it regardless of whether it's in set A. So I'm going to list everything. So if I were to do, using the example from above, A union B, or the eye colors in grade 9, union the eye colors in grade 10. Another way to say it is eye colors in grade 9 or the eye colors in grade 10, it's going to be all of them. Blue, brown, green, hazel, gray. Everything that's in 9 and 10 gets listed. Notice I don't list repeats. I list everything one time, but all of the eye colors get listed. Okay, so that's not that hard, but it's probably new. And uh, the big thing to keep in mind is what the symbolism is. 
Union looks like a U. If it's upside down, if it's an upside down U, it can't be union because it's not a U anymore. It must be intersect. All right, then just one other concept that I'm sure is brand new. This one does not get covered uh, in math courses very often. That's the idea of closure. We say that a set has closure under a given operation. So I don't just say this set has closure. It has to have closure under a given operation. This set is closed under addition. This is that is closed under multiplication, closed under uh, subtraction, or some, some operation, if the outcome of the operation in any two members of the set is also a member of the set. What does that mean? Let's take a look at a real world example of that. Here's a statement. The set of whole numbers is closed under addition. Now, is that true? We're going we're gonna to evaluate the truth of the statement. That's what we're going to do with closure. We're going to evaluate the truth of statements about closure. Well, if I perform operations, let's see, the operation I'm allowed to perform is addition. That's one that's named. If I perform addition on two whole numbers, do I get another whole number? Okay, so whole numbers are zero and the natural numbers. Uh, so if I did like 0 plus 8, is that still a whole number? Yes. 0 plus 15? Yes. 15 plus 20? Yes. In fact, because I'm adding a positive number to an existing number, I can't possibly get a negative number. And since I'm adding whole numbers, I can't possibly get fractions. The, the lowest, smallest numbers I get are 0 and 0, and 0 plus 0 is still a whole number. So... I would say that this is true. The set of whole numbers is closed under addition. That's true. What about this one? The set of whole numbers is closed under subtraction. Can I subtract two whole numbers to get something that's not a whole number? Well, what I'm looking for with this statement, by the way, is called a counterexample. A counterexample is an example that proves the statement false, and you only need one. If you can find one counterexample, you have proven the statement false. So my counterexample for this statement, the set of whole numbers is closed under subtraction, would be 5 minus 8. 5 is a whole number. 8 is a whole number. 5 minus 8 is negative 3. That's not a whole number. That's an integer. Uh, so because uh, I can prove that this statement is false, uh, I, I have a counterexample that proves the statement is false. This, so I would say the set of whole numbers is not closed under subtraction. This is a false statement. All right, and those are the rest of the terms that you need to know for lesson one in algebra. Next, we're going to be working some practice problems involving the concepts we've learned here.